Well, welcome to the fourth session of a study group on peacekeeping. Um, today I'm happy to continue our reflection on the politics of UN peacekeeping and to dedicate this particular seminar on the US policy on peacekeeping. So as you may know, the relationship between the US and the UN has not always, always been so easy. Uh, Washington was quite enthusiastic about the UN uh, and collective security after the Cold War uh, and supported the development of UN <coughs> new complex uh, peacekeeping operations that fitted well with the new um, international order and could serve American interests. So there was a real policy of assertive multilateralism uh, and in the early 90s. Uh, however, this approach, as you may know, was challenged when the U.S. support to the U.N. peacekeeping in Somalia um, ended with a joint failure to disarm warlords and the death of 18 um, American soldiers in Mogadishu. So this was a real turning point for the U.S. contribution to U.N. peacekeeping. That was often called the Somalia syndrome, an aversion to any proactive action or intervention to respond to civil wars uh, in um, in uh, failed states and to actively participate in peacekeeping operations. So many, many analysts uh, explain the lack of US engagement in Rwanda, for example, during the genocide as a direct consequence of such a trauma. So since then, what's the vision of Washington regarding peacekeeping? What were the real consequences of the events in Somalia, in Rwanda, in Bosnia, and the contribution of the US in UN peacekeeping operations? What was the position of the different U.S. administrations on peacekeeping? What is the U.S. doctrine on peacekeeping? What type of link is made by Washington between U.N. peacekeeping and other collective security tools like NATO? Uh, those are all the questions that we want to answer today. To answer those questions, so we have a pleasure to host Charles Dunbar, lecturer in international relations at Boston University. Uh, Mr. Dunbar has uh, more than 30 years of experience with the U.S. foreign services and was, among others, ambassador to Qatar and to Yemen. Mr. Dunbar also has a significant experience with peacekeeping as he was the Secretary General's special representative of um, MINURSO in Western Sahara for the peacekeeping mission there. Um, so thank you, Mr. Dunbar, for being with us. Well, it's a great pleasure to, to be here and to uh, have met NAMI and um, <coughs> It is good that I'm not talking about Western Sahara because it has a deep technical fascination. And um, uh, when I get to talking about it, and this happened, we had lunch together, and when I get to talking about it, it just comes out. And she was very polite. She was able to keep her eyes open and actually didn't get to eat all her lunch because she was being super polite to uh, so that she could listen to what I have to say. It has a great... Uh, technical interest, but um, uh, its significance in the grand scheme of things, I think, with every respect to my uh, two Moroccan, new Moroccan friends, uh, uh, of limited significance. Um, this isn't the start of a PowerPoint, or rather it's the start and the finish of a PowerPoint, because I understood uh, uh, Nami to say that um, don't usually use PowerPoint. She didn't say it in so many words, but I'm a diplomat and I listen to the music as well as to the, to the actual words. Uh, I'm also influenced by having done a number of talks for, um, for uh, <clears throat> American military personnel who were deploying to Afghanistan because that's a country that I uh, spent a lot of time in and know something about. And uh, if that had been a military slide, it would say takeaways on the top. And uh, those are the points that um, I think uh, I take out of this discussion. I thought that I would sort of wing it, and um, there are people here who would like to, uh, to talk and I'd get a good discussion going. I know I won't have any trouble of doing that, uh, doing that here. Um, but I think instead I will just uh, contribute on sort of a historical um, theme points that I think are important about the U.S.-U.N. Uh, relationship. Um, 
and uh, can uh, make points where I can what I have observed uh, personally about that relationship. I ask the indulgence of the, um, the Americans in this room uh, for points that I may, will make that, uh, that to them are or should be second nature. Uh, it is a, a, a complex relationship, there's no question about it. Uh, I think it's worth remembering way back at the beginning that it was the United States that began thinking creatively about this subject long before World War II uh, was over. The uh, person uh, who was responsible for organizing a lot of that was former Secretary of State and Senator from Tennessee, Cordell Hull, uh, who was someone that, uh, that was not on President Roosevelt's A-list. Uh, and so he had time, and he wasn't in a, a genuine internationalist. And I want to emphasize that that's a theme in American thinking. So the, the Dumbarton Notes Conference and the, uh, the thinking that came out of that was, was important. And uh, it's interesting that President Roosevelt himself, while he hated war, as he said it, was very much concerned about ceding significant power to an international organization and uh, had to be persuaded by Churchill uh, to allow this uh, organization to get started. And it got started uh, and very quickly uh, shifting to, um, to what we're talking about today uh, was unable to do very much directly about the, um, the uh, uh, United Nations Charter's directive that uh, the, the organization was, was set up to save su succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And we all understand, I don't need to mention this to you, what happened. There was a Cold War and uh, the, uh, the um, United Nations became a debating society, certainly through much of my uh, career in the State Department. It was exactly that and most of the things that we were doing took place in the General Assembly and we, like everybody else, were trying to get our points across uh, officers in the um, in American embassies, including our member in particular uh, in Rabat, once a year were charged with going over to the foreign ministry and talking through the issues that were going to come up in the assembly and to explain why we thought that uh, that Puerto Rican statehood was a really bad idea and we hoped that, um, that other countries by the time we got through with them had heard of, um, of Puerto Rican statehood I, uh, uh, and uh, had heard of Puerto Rico rather and um, uh, would, um, would vote our way. One um, tiny anecdote from that period as a young uh, second secretary of the American Embassy in Rabat, um, I had to go over and make a pitch on the um, law of the sea, which was a major issue in the, 19, in the 1970s. And um, this was, uh, NAMI would not have been proud of my limited knowledge of international law and the law of the sea, but we were sent talking points. Um, I can't remember if I had to do it in French. My French is still not all I would like it to be, but it really wasn't all I would like it to be in 1974. But um, we made this pitch, there was somebody else there with me, to uh, a man whose name won't come back to me at the moment, who was the head of the legal division of the uh, Moroccan Foreign Ministry, and one of the really great experts on law of the sea uh, in, the, in the world. He was, he was in the, definitely in the top ten. And so he politely listened to all this and said something to the effect of, thank you very much, that's interesting. I was talking to the legal advisor in the State Department yesterday on this subject, and I think you haven't got 
you aren't seeing eye to eye with the legal advisor on the fourth point that you made. And uh, I said, I see, well, that, uh, that's noted and I appreciate your, uh, your help. So we did that and we debated and we scored debating points and that was, that was kind of the way it was. However, there were things that began to complicate uh, the relationship and the first one was uh, the non-aligned movements uh, effort in the mid-1970s to create a new international economic order and to elaborate a system under which the world's wealth uh, with the agreement of the wealthy would be shared more than it was with the, um, with the, uh, the non-aligned movement. I was serving in Algeria at the time and um, uh, the, uh, the Algerians, as you know, were a moving spirit behind the convening of the special United Nations General Assembly uh, on the new international economic order. And the United States spent the next uh, a decade or so seeing that the, um, the non-aligned movements proposed new international order went economic order went nowhere and uh, eventually succeeded in that, uh, that noble endeavor and um, it did not, uh, at the same time, uh, we found uh, the rhetoric of the non-aligned movement and of the, uh, as it was represented in the United Nations, very distasteful. We felt that the non-aligned movement was uh, not non-aligned. We couldn't understand why Cuba was involved with it, try as we might, and we didn't try very hard to understand why Cuba was involved. Uh, we simply didn't like it. We had a very eloquent um, ambassador to the United Nations, the late Senator uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, um, who was particularly enjoyed, uh, particularly uh, his ethnicity, like mine, is Irish, and he enjoyed a good argument. And so he enjoyed explaining to the uh, <clears throat> members of the non-aligned movement why they were not, uh, why they were not non-aligned, and uh, why, in particular, that they were not democratic. Even although many of them were called the Democratic Republic of uh, something or other, Algeria, for example, Democratic and Popular Republic of Algeria, Algerian Democratic and Popular Republic, to translate it accurately from French, um, and. Then overlaid on that was the whole question of Zionism versus racism and the effect that that had on American policy and putting us into confrontation with uh, a large majority in the, in the General Assembly. Um, and we began acting on that, uh, our strong view that Zionism was not racism. Uh, and began the practice during the Reagan administration of withholding our dues uh, from, the, from the UN. So that was kind of the way it was as the, uh, as the Cold War ended. And um, uh, the, it was an organization that we quickly began more or less to support. Uh, there are a number of famous statements, including one by uh, President George H.W. Bush's Secretary of State, James Baker, uh, who loomed large in my life because as the Moroccans know, or they should know, pay attention, uh, uh, James Baker was Secretary General Kofi Annan's uh, personal envoy for Western Sahara when I was working in it. Baker said the United States should not be the world's number one deadbeat. And, um, the, the Bush administration took a position strongly against um, uh, our not, not paying our dues because we didn't like some of the policies of some elements of the United Nations. We also suspended our participation in, um, in a couple, uh, more than a couple, but I think of two of them at the moment, the ILO and UNESCO uh, because of their, uh, their support of that, um, of that resolution. It was repealed under the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, the the uh, resolution was repealed. But the new era dawned and uh, the United States 
began to think that at last the rest of the world had seen the light and would see things as we saw them. Uh, George H.W. Bush's new international order, I think, had that kind of um, uh, implicit in what he was seeing. And the then the United Nations becomes very important uh, because the United Nations is going to, and U.S. foreign policy, are going to um, uh, to uh, come come together, and uh, we will all go off into a into a future that is certainly happier for the United States and presumably happier for other countries in the world as well. It was during this period that um, that uh, former <coughs> UN ambassador and first uh, uh, female Secretary of State of the United Nations, Madeleine Albright, made one of her two statements that I think if there are two statements she would like to have back, um, uh, she would go to considerable lengths to, to getting them expunged from the records. Uh, the first one was allegedly said to Colin Powell, and I can, uh, I can see uh, how Colin Powell might have reacted. It was, we have this great big army, why don't we use it? Uh, and Colin Powell didn't see that that was uh, something that you just uh, randomly deployed uh, American military power to um, make things better in the world. And the other was a sort of multilateralism. And that was the point that uh, we would now go forward with our friends and, um, and we hoped as many friends as possible would join us and make the world a better place. We did support actively the, um, uh, the beginning of the rash of complex peace operations that, um, that came into being in the early 1990s. And um, uh, there was a particular, I was at that time uh, between opportunities in the State Department and therefore was doing some work in our International Organizations Bureau on uh, peace operations and saw at close range the very close and symbiotic relationship that existed between Kofi Annan and, um, and the United States government and uh, the United States State Department in particular. We thought a great deal of Kofi Annan and I think any of you who has, uh, who has not had the pleasure of meeting Kofi Annan should seek every opportunity to do so and those of you who have uh, had the pleasure of meeting with him would understand why we felt that way. It also was very convenient because he quickly became our candidate uh, to succeed the only Secretary General uh, who was denied a second term as Secretary General at the instigation of, uh, of the United States. So Kofi Annan, it was, a, it was a very close relationship, talking to him constantly. Did I, I hope I said, he was Under Secretary General for peacekeeping operations at that time. And um, so it was something that was, um, that was of, of great interest to us. And I even got to spend 10 days in um, uh, Somalia, in Mogadishu, uh, working with the uh, United Nations and the um, uh, international personnel who were there, UNITAF was still the, uh, the boss in <coughs> Somalia, and uh, identifying <coughs> positions to which we could second uh, U.S. government officials to work in the new and mightier Minerso. Uh, I will say I had the pleasure at that, uh, in that connection of having at least a ritual meeting with a man called Ismat Kitani, who was one of the giant uh, United Nations career uh, functionar uh, functionaries on Iraqi Kurd, and noting how he was looking at how things were developing and was sort of anxious to pull in his horns, did not want to say, oh, we can get out and really help uh, this new um, Somali government to get on its feet. And um, yes, I'd like to have 50 uh, 
American functionary seconded to, uh, to uh, UNISOM II. Uh, I may have said Minerso somewhere in there. If I did, forgive me. The, I meant to say to say Unisom, and um, uh, things went as they went in Somalia. And I think this gets to the point of our. It's not even disdain uh, for the United Nations. It's kind of it's kind of worse than that. It's just not not getting it, not understanding how. Um, how the United how the United Nations work and works and how the rest of the world works. It was simply a case of um, and uh, one uh, other element that was difficult in the, at this time was the fact that we assigned a uh, an American vice admiral, former deputy national security advisor, to President uh, Bush. And I think he was being changed as the as the Clinton administration came in, Admiral Jonathan Howe, to the um, uh, to the post of SRSG in um, in Unison, uh, and Admiral Howe was used to giving orders. And had, uh, when you get to be Vice Admiral, as I'm sure you will, you will uh, I think you will uh, be used to giving orders and having them carried out, and not. Uh, State Department bureaucrats are far more used to giving orders and having nothing happen at all. That's part of the part of the culture, and we uh, we find our ways as, as we can to to make it work well. But a, a separate channel was established to the White House, um, and um, I didn't write down his name. As I come in, it'll come back to me in a minute. Uh, was the channel in the White House of former State Department, senior State Department officer. God, I can see his face. Anybody want to see his pop quiz? Anybody want to say who it was? Not one of you. Oh, dear. Uh, that's so I, I flunked the pop quiz. And, uh, early 90s. Hmm? Must have been in the early 90s. It was, yes. He wrote a book about counter, he was the counterterrorism guy in 2001. Oh, white. Oh, no. Um, he wrote a book about 911, a very interesting Clark, book. He, sorry, Clark, yeah. thank you very much. Richard Clark. Yeah. Right. Why didn't you say it earlier? <laughs> uh, Richard Clark was the channel, and the rest is history. We had our own uh, military operation in Minerso that operated independent of the force commander, who was a Turkish lieutenant, major lieutenant general, named Bir, and um, it was in complete violation of how. Um, how a military operation is supposed to work. We were undermining it. Anyway, uh, what happened happened, and it's very familiar to, uh, to all of you. And it did set back peacekeeping enormously, flashing back to the United States dimension of this. Um, uh, and the point that our very centralized system of operating uh, our national security policy means that the, uh, the center, the president, is, is very powerful. The White House, I would say, if anything, has gained uh, a lot of power, and that has continued under President Obama. But President Clinton had a lot on his, everybody, every president has a lot on his plate, and Mogadishu, Somalia, simply didn't make the cut. And all of a sudden, there were 18 dead Marines on the uh, 7 o'clock news, or whenever the TV news, well, I don't have a TV, whenever it, uh, it happened. And Clinton, famous for his, uh, his uh, temper, said what the uh, number of colorful Arkansas-type expletives followed is going on. Where, where's Somalia? Uh, although I will say that I'm, uh, no less a personage than Robert Gates said this when he came and made a speech in, Clinton, in um, Cleveland, where I was at the time that uh, he was charged with briefing President Clinton at the change of administration and said he was the smartest man he ever met. He said he saw somebody who was retaining everything. Anyway, he hadn't retained this. And that begat Somalia syndrome and the famous PDD-25. I should say in NAMI, I was talking so much about, um, about Western Sahara that I forgot. My successor at BU, 
whose name is Robert Loftus, Ambassador Robert Loftus, wrote PDD 25. So um, uh, you can <coughs> have him over and see what he thinks about it. And um, PDD 25 happened, the disasters in first in Rwanda, and then later in Bosnia took place as well. Uh, nothing particularly new there. Um, and uh, can you give, give us some elements on PDD 25? PDD 25 basically spelled out when the United and in what way the United States would participate in UN operations. And the uh, bottom rung was we would not oppose it in the Security Council. That would be the first. The second was that uh, whether we would participate um, other than, than paying our dues, whether we would put personnel into a non-Chapter 7 uh, uh, operation. And finally, there may have been four or five operations, but the final one was when we would commit troops. And that was stated in a way uh, that it had to serve I won't go as far as to say vital national interests of the United States, but it had to be in the strong interest, <coughs> national security interests of the United States for us to commit troops to a, uh, to a peace operation. And um, uh, that was what was signed by the President a year later as um, James Dobbins in one of the, the readings says that, that uh, PDD 25 passed into oblivion very, very quickly, because things changed and we begin to see the bright side again. I, I think that uh, we owe a great deal to the late Richard Holbrook for his organizational zeal. Uh, Richard Holbrook, as you probably know, was, was bored as ambassador to Germany. And it shows a large spirit, somebody who could be bored being ambassador to Germany as someone uh, I suppose I admire, but I can't. <laughs> It would be a job that I would uh, have been very delighted to have and was calling people up uh, in the middle of the night over here because he was up and they should be too and um, saying that he wanted something, something better to do and then seized this opportunity uh, when Srebrenica happened and the rest of that also is history. I think we owe the Dayton Peace Accord with all of its imperfections to Holbrook's uh, bulldog energy, uh, uh, to his being a bulldozer of a diplomat, and uh, peace was made in, um, in Bosnia. And of course, in Bosnia comes the first instance, somebody correct me on this if I've got it wrong, of using a uh, an outside military force as to replace you know, a United Nations uh, force commander and command. And that, of course, was I-4 in, um, in, in Bosnia. And then the, I think all of that Bosnia experience of having the, uh, the high representative exist of the European Union and I, may, I am, may have gotten that wrong. Please correct me. I'm uh, absolutely bulletproof. I'll, I'll weep when I'm falling asleep tonight, but I won't be bothered with it if you do. The high representative, I think, was a brilliant idea. It sat somewhere, had a website, and occasionally stepped in and um, made the, uh, the, the uh, government in Bosnia-Herzegovina do certain things that it was not inclined to do. I think the whole, uh, the way that mission rose and it's, it, the sun rose and set on it was extremely interesting with the high representative still, I believe, having it, it, at least the office existing. There, there are some people who have <coughs> suitable employment doing not very much perhaps in the office of the high representative. Uh, so I think that was a, was a very was a, a success. Of course, U.S. politics 
intervened again, and um, I think that there might have been a, a more serious move to withdraw at least U.S. support for I-4 uh, were it not for the presence in the, um, in the um, United, uh, United States Senate and on the United States Foreign Relations Committee of Senator George Voinovich, a senator who has passed into, he had a, a moderately distinguished career in the, uh, in the U.S. Senate, but he was from Cleveland and his mother uh, was, uh, I, was Croatian and his father was Serbian and he simply <laughs> uh, said to his colleagues on the Foreign Relations Committee, this ain't gonna, we're not leaving this. And um, yes, I owe you something for, uh, for doing that and uh, the, the mission lived out its life. Um, same thing I think with Kosovo uh, where uh, again Mr. Holbrook was active but unable to uh, to convince the um, uh, the um, uh, no, Milosevic that he needed to stop beating up on the uh, on the Kosovars and therefore uh, the United States went in uh, to the Kosovo, leading uh, uh, the um, the NATO forces, um, the uh, we it was known that we could not get a resolution through the Security Council, and therefore chose that route. Kofi Annan switched as quickly as he could, and at that time was I believe that's the time was pronouncing his doctrine of there being a sovereign a higher. Uh, law than simply the, than uh, the Charter of the United Nations uh, organization. And uh, uh, UNMIC and its the, uh, the very large complex organization was stood up and I think worked, uh, worked well. Uh, I must say I never quite understood and I hope somebody here does and can help me out on this. I was very much opposed to um, to our getting out of um, to the our forcing the uh, situation not to continue as it was continuing and forcing there to be a vote on um, on Serbian independence uh, on uh, Kosovo Kosovo's independence. You got a point you want to make on that? Um, and um, uh, that I think is one thing to say about about diplomats. You know, there's the there's an expression that we stand on its head, and we have a very strong tendency to say, "Don't just do something; stand there." Uh, if things are okay, and somebody is likely to get really pissed off if you um, if you move, why move? We can do it another year. Let's see what how things are, how they how they develop. Anyway, it happened, and it seems to have worked. Although we do not have a 194th member of the um, of the United Nations yet, and um, I think that would be fair. That issue would be fairly far down on our agenda in light of the present situation. Um, on the present day, let me just see if I've covered. Um, no, there are some details I could go, I could go into. I do think that President Obama's invo personal involvement in the Sudan uh, referendum and pushing for that referendum uh, was done in good faith. But again, this is a situation where. I think there was insufficient attention paid to the fact that the United Nations having mandated a, uh, a long period of peace building in Somalia um, and having had the, uh, the two protagonists, um, John Garang uh, and Osman Ali Taha uh, for the government in Khartoum, having a vision of the fact that you could actually keep uh, 
Sudan together. Uh, Garang's being killed in, um, in uh, a helicopter crash, which as far as I know was not, was a, a mechanical uh, failure or was a failure other than somebody shooting it out of the sky, uh, was changed that whole dynamic, in my opinion. And I think that should have been taken into account. There are a lot of people, I had a kid who wrote a, um, an honors thesis at Boston University uh, where he, <laughs> he looked into it deeply and just said, this thing isn't going to fly. This is going to be a terrible situation. And um, he was right in, uh, in a way that I think a lot of people didn't see and I think that we should have. Um, that, I think, more or less brings us up to, the, up to the present as far as peace operations are concerned, uh, except for uh, the contribution that I think we have helped to make of having, uh, of having regional organizations more involved. That happened in Europe and it was relatively easy and I think people look back at the experience of the two missions in Europe and wonder how such a situation can be created and all eyes turn to the African Union and gazes frequently are averted when that is done. But I want to say that I think that the, the progress that has been made by the African Union in being something other than just literally a, um, uh, a, a, uh, an appendage on a peace operation, the only really substantive dealing I had with my counterpart who was the OAU representative in Western Sahara was when I received a formal letter from him uh, two days after I arrived, wondering why I had not yet gone and paid a courtesy call on him that then was ritually exchanged. And the, uh, the, the, they were doing nothing. Uh, it is much different now, I think. And that, I see another opportunity for us to be creative in, and I think AFRICOM is doing this, perhaps you'd like to come in on this. I, didn't, I can't say your rank, so I, uh, I don't know your rank, so I can't say it, but... Uh, well, I, I'm not there yet, so I... <laughs> no, but I mean, you may have, you may have studied it. Yeah. Uh, the possibility of cooperation uh, with, uh, between AFRICOM and governments in the, uh, in the region is one that should be, uh, should be explored. I also, uh, deferring as I must, being uh, a former representative of a, of a little tiny organization, uh, and there's somebody from DOD in the room, I'm not standing up uh, and saluting physically, but I am saying I think the military, uh, American military, for all the mistakes that its masters have made in the last decade, in Afghanistan and Iraq should be given full marks for uh, beginning to anticipate what an American, major American military role in international peacekeeping would look like and uh, setting, up a, setting about learning systematically uh, how to be better at United Nations peacekeeping and taking in all the various doctrines that are not necessarily ones that you would expect military officers to uh, like uh, uh, very sharply limited rules of engagement, you would not necessarily expect them to think that's a good thing. But they view the world, uh, the bureaucratic world as it is, see that this is a likelihood and study and prepare themselves for it. I think I'll stop there. I second and that, by the way. I'm impressed by what they're doing recently. Yeah, I keep going. Second, yeah. what you're saying, I'm impressed by what the military expand. Are. They're really working. Look at how many are here. Mm -hmm. They're really. I don't know how many are. Work. How many military people are there here? I'm talking about the, at the school. At the school, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and other schools. Thank you. Sorry for the misunderstanding. I'm impressed. I, I don't want to declare their role because. It, what they're doing, but I'm impressed by the ones that I've met, mm -hmm. what they're doing, 
and the way they're affecting policies to come. And how they beautifully overcome, for example, uh, I haven't gone into all the, um, to all the um, <coughs> domestic U.S. politics, and I will simply sum it up by saying, if you like sausage, don't visit uh, Washington. If you like political sausage, maybe don't visit uh, the factory in Washington, D.C. Um, that uh, the, there's this big issue about American troops will never serve under foreign command. And um, the, the other one that is, there is a lot of substantive concern about this. Uh, countries where American troops are likely to serve uh, should have status of forces agreement bilateral with the United States uh, government. That is understanding you know, American troops have a certain aura of radioactivity when they are in full battle rattle and um, doing their thing in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I think without such an agreement, uh, there should be concern about doing it. But serving under foreign commanders is just an, an issue that, that Washington loves, because uh, we'll never have our boys fighting under somebody who can't speak English. And uh, one of the factors that's really benefiting this is the average age of the officers. The officers are younger. Mm -hmm and much better educated now. Mm -hmm. They're smarter. They yeah. really are smart. They've learned from the mistakes of the past. And military people do that all the time. It's the Germans perfected that. Mm -hmm. they're, they're learning, and they're doing good. And so the average age of the officers now is way younger than it used to be. You can bask in my diplomat's flattery. Uh, you are seeing kind of the cream of the crop at the, at the uh, see Harvard the Kennedy School. See you see it, it in all. other places. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I uh, certainly. I, I, I would just, I guess, I would just caution on. I mean, it is good. There is adaptability. Uh, when you when you say like, hey, this is the problem that you're dealing with. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of force. Sometimes a little force. But I, you know, being at DoD and probably in for at least you know another couple of years. I mean, I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the whole uh, Department of Defense turning on a dime and training for a peacekeeping mission or operation. I mean, you have this, you still have the, the whole defense industrial complex that sells major weapon systems and and has a, has a huge lobby. Um, and, and, and the hardest missions to train for are the very kinetic ones. So, yes, it's good, yes, it's adaptable, but we've learned hard lessons over the last 10, you know, plus years. We'll carry those, my generation will carry those with us, but... Uh, maybe rewrite some and update some of the document, but you know you're going to have outlaw lobbyists. Well, yeah, right. But I mean, brigade combat teams that, from the army that go out to the, you know the desert out in California to do training. They're, you know, what do they? What do you think they're training for? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see that changing that drastically. Well, that's that's a very good corrective, and I but I, I do want to make the point, and um, you know I am at the head of the line of the people who say that the United States government has got to understand uh, that we have now, and uh, we have given it at least what appears to be our best shot in Afghanistan and most particularly in Iraq. And the result has not been all that good. Uh, I was a, Way worse than a, a semi-illiterate person that I am. I came suddenly to the Italians say it more elegantly than we do that I came to discover America when I thought, oh, you know, something about great power is that uh, you should never use it. You should simply flex your muscles on the beach, but don't use it. Here's the second quiz. Uh, who, got, who got the first one right? You did. The, um, who said that? Europeans ought to know it. A great European statesman, uh, I don't know how many centuries ago, a lot. You know who it is already? Oh, yeah. don't, uh, don't touch that dial. I thought you were going <laughs> to. For no? great European phrases, I would always guess Bismarck. Niccolo Machiavelli <laughs> said it. Really? Yep. And uh, we have appeared, we haven't. Of course, we could destroy Afghanistan. 
if we wanted to. Or we could destroy Iraq. Thank God we, uh, we don't want to do that. But we have pretty much tried to fix it, and it hasn't gotten fixed. And we need to be thinking and very yeah, seriously about right, the implications of it. Legal and moral obligations. Look what's going on in Camp Liberty right, right this minute. What's going on where? Camp Liberty. Camp Haraya. Weren't you at um, Richard Norton's presentation recently with the Iraqi military? No, he doesn't invite me since I became a lecturer. You got to be kidding. I thought I saw you there. Um, Tell him I said so. No. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm in Maine. I probably wouldn't have. I'm sure it was posted someplace. Yeah. And, it's a long no, poke no, down I from Maine. Only for like NAMI would I... 280 millimeter rockets are being slaughtered like insects. Mm -hmm. And they're all refugees under the protection of the United States and nobody's lifting a finger to help them. Mm -hmm. There were hostages that were taken from Camp Ashraf. I provided precise intelligence on where they were to the State Department. The State Department acknowledged that they knew where they were but said it's confidential. Nobody did anything. Nobody put any pressure on Al Maliki. Mm -hmm. I think the U.S. is kind of embarrassed about what happened over there. Yeah. And the ambassador made In our war of use. choice, to quote uh, yeah. Mr. Um, Richard Haas, and Afghanistan being a war of necessity, and we chose to do Iraq. I think I will. Do I need to, should I read through these? Am I, did I get the quotation right? Yeah, I didn't put the, close the quote on the that. Um, I do think there's, uh, there is grounds to be, there are grounds to be hopeful. And uh, we've done some good things in the past, and I think we can continue to do it. But the point, the next to final one, is um, that I very much hope in this current crisis, that we can um, find a way to bring Mr. Putin to his senses because we have very, very significant interests in Syria. I would throw in Iraq if, we, if that can be fixed in some way. But we broke that one. But in Syria and in uh, containing the Iranian uh, nuclear program, and we can't do that without, um, without Mr. Putin being there. And that's where diplomats come in. And finally, listen. hope is not a plan, he as the military say. So over to you. What, what do you want to talk about? Thank you very much. I have a quick question. Maybe it needs a long answer. But you, you spoke about the difference and the questioning you had between Zionism and racism. And eventually, eventually you arrived to the, to the conclusion that it was different. Can you tell me or tell us how where was the hesitation, where it could be similar, and where, why eventually it was defined as being different. And from that, like today, we have UNIFIL, which is only in South Lebanon, and the Israeli force are not allowed, and mm -hmm. they do it every day, but they're not allowed to go in the south of Lebanon. I understand the peace process could be, between Palestine and Israel, could be much easier if there was no military occupation by the Israeli forces in Palestine. Do you think we could change the mandate, and what would be the position of the U.S. to change the mandate of uh, UNSO, uh, the True Supervision Organization, to withdraw IDF, to put some UN forces like we do in, in UNIFIL in South Lebanon? It, it's most likely not acceptable, but could you explain to me where... Where are you speaking? We would, I, I, I thought you were saying put a peace operation in Palestine? UNSO is already here. It's been here for since mm -hmm. 48, but it's, not, it's an observing mission. Maybe it could be a bit more... Uh, not enforcing, but a bit more like UNIFIL, you know, kind of, and so that would allow one way or another to withdraw IDF from or the occupied territories and, and ease the peace process, which is difficult. Mm -hmm. It's just non-existent, and of yeah. course... It's a very interesting suggestion. Yeah, it's an interesting suggestion, and uh, there's a big elephant standing in the room, <laughs> and you know who he is and what the, what the problem is. Yeah, oh yeah, there was... Another Secretary of State, uh, the the Israeli incursion into into Lebanon, the, the 2006, 2006, right, and operation. And still every day today, yeah. You know today. what Condoleezza Rice called that? No. The birth pangs of the new Middle East. It ain't going to uh, I think there is a, uh, I think she would really like to have that one back. But... Um, 
the uh, I just don't think it's going to it's going to happen for reasons of uh, domestic U.S. politics and the immense success, which I hope is not translated into some sort of failure, of the Israelis in um, making uh, American the American political establishment. Uh, not do things that the Israeli government does not want to have done. And under Mr. Netanyahu, that's a pretty long list. So, maybe going back to my initial question, yes. can you try to explain me why Zionism is not racism and what, where are the connections and where, why eventually you decided it was not similar? I can't explain it to you in substance. Uh -huh. The reason it happened was we got enough votes. Although, you know, I think, no, I, I can't. I, I, you're going to get me... Uh, in over my head, and I prefer not to do that. But I, I, I must say, I don't see it that way. I do not see it as racism. I think that it, I support that decision that we fostered in the General Assembly. I think the uh, policies that some Zionists have pursued are uh, not very much to my liking. Sorry. Yes. So you've talked about oh, this. Carol has a question. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate uh, you sharing so much with us. Um, I'm really curious as to your view on where the U.S. is heading with respect to thinking about global politics, potentially intervention, and to and given the, the domestic politics in America. Um, how, where, what are we going to see in the next five to ten years? As well as, um, I mean, in that line, like what hope is there for the world of people who maybe, um, I don't want to use the word oppressed, but let's say oppressed by governments or armed groups and etc. Okay, I think basically you're going to see uh, a reluctance to become involved in, um, in what could turn out to be a war of choice. That's very much a function of the cycles of the way Americans think about things. I think there will be no difficulty. I will make one exception, and I, I hope very much that it doesn't happen. If uh, Mr. Putin makes the terrible mistake of uh, provoking, let's say, well, the occupation of all the Ukraine, uh, I think that would probably do it. I'm, and I'm really speaking out of my depth because I hope that there's a lot going on down uh, inside the Beltway that I don't know about. I hope <laughs> for the, the sake of the Republic and uh, I guess the future of uh, of. Uh, United States and Europe at least, uh, that that is the case. Uh, that would be something over which nationalist sentiment could be, could be built up in, in the U.S. over time, as it was built up uh, with the, uh, the 911 um, catastrophe and what has, what has followed. But I think we're in a period where we will be very reluctant to put boots on the ground almost anywhere on our I, I see he's coming uh, he's coming back I hoped he hadn't walked out mad or at least maybe he was so mad that he forgot his coat but uh, I guess he's coming back um, the um, uh, and I do think that the United States will participate gladly at least will do its, its part, and I haven't talked about what the United States part should be, but I think it's very important to have the, um, the, the sanction of the Security Council. Then it is, it has the good housekeeping seal of approval. And that's another point I should have made about the United States. The United States really does care whether it has the good housekeeping seal of approval from the United Nations and it's proved so again and again. Uh, so wherever 
there are difficulties. Uh, we are prepared to participate in a way that we think is appropriate. And I think that there will be, again, there will be some creative thinking on that. Um, that we will, and, and of course we, I think very rightly, fall back on the idea of that we can do a great deal to support peace operations without boots on the ground. Uh, and that has to do with our, uh, our ability to lift a lot of things very quickly to any corner of the globe in a very short period of time with communications. I shudder a little bit when I talk about intelligence, but certainly electronic intelligence, if we can read it right, uh, whereas Mr. Snowden, when we need him, uh, uh, the, that is something we can do. Human intelligence, we, we do well sometimes and not so well the other times, and that's true of a lot of, of different countries. I think there's a lot that we can do uh, to support uh, peace operations that are organized, and I believe that we will do that. I don't think we are going to uh, face a syndrome such as the Vietnam syndrome as a result of what has gone on. But I do want to say we need to be thinking very deeply. And I know that, um, that the Pentagon and, uh, will be doing that, and I hope the rest of the government does, about what we've learned from the Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I think particularly the, the Iraq problem, because we didn't have to do it. Yes, sir. No, wait, did you ask? No, somebody did. No. Um, there was somebody over there. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, just oh, wait, on. you organized this. Yes, Go. it's yeah. going well. So. <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't want to have somebody suppressed. Oh, yeah. um, so this is a question, you can answer this, really anyone can answer this. I kind of want to just throw the question out, which is, uh, um, and I'm not even sure how to put it exactly, but, but we could conceive of an international order that's fully ideal in our minds, that's free of powered interests, as it should be. Um, but of course, we live in a world where there are na powerful national interests that are going to drive foreign policy. So people like yourself, everyone in this room probably finds ourselves in the position where if we're going to advocate for some kind of peacekeeping operation because it's the right thing to do. Um, we're, opportun we're opportunists. We're taking whatever kinds of opportunities we can get to do the right thing. Um, but it seems that there's this, every time we in the U.S. do that, um, and we don't abide by international rules, regulations, norms, principles, something that can be universally justified, we can do damage to the international system. And we can do damage also to the hope of ever creating a more fair international order, which is particularly important when we start looking several generations on down the line. It could be important to Americans who are looking several generations on down the line and seeing the waning of American power. I guess I'm wondering if you'd just speak to some of the, um, the trade-offs involved that, that you've experienced in um, seizing whatever opportunities we can to, uh, to either do a peacekeeping operation or not, not a UN sanctioned peacekeeping operation but a military intervention, uh, humanitarian intervention like we could possibly do in Syria at this time um, or that was more likely several months ago. Gina, I wish you'd ask a little bigger question. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of detailed. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, life is is going to continue. I will um, don't get uh, too maybe maybe you aren't weepy for the uh, the decline of American influence in the world. I don't think that is is reversible. I don't think that is if it's happening is irreversible. I guess what I I don't, uh, an, uh, another point, and it's, it's obvious, uh, or it should be to Americans, we have lived for out, throughout our history 
between our two shining seas, and we've had those evil neighbors to deal with, Canada and Mexico, on our borders. And I think this has, has begotten, I, sorry, just to be clear, they're not evil. <laughs> they are very easy neighbors to deal with in the grand scheme of neighbors that you could have. Uh, the, um, we therefore think that to every problem there's a solution. And that has been a strain in our foreign policy thinking that we can go out and fix things. And we can't. And that does not mean that we are not a great power. I think for the uh, deeply foreseeable future, we will be the biggest military power in the world. The uh, large cuts in the... Um, Bigger than China? Sorry? Bigger than China. Good point. They're going to supersede us. That's the first thing I said stupid. They're going to supersede No, it wasn't the first thing I said stupid. It's the first thing I no, recognize no. as being stupid. <laughs> no, You're right. It's not stupid, but, yep. but, but we actually started yeah. a military partnership with them because Mr. Putin's not <laughs> with India. I've talked to Air Force officers. Yes, I know all about that. Yeah, and, and We're thinking ahead. But they are I'm going to make another, another <laughs> general point here. China it, it is an enormous project. It, 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 I mean, it's going to be the biggest thing that has happened in the world in a very long time. Uh, just the, when you consider the figures, uh, he may have a figure for the number of people that they are going to move, are going to help facilitate. Even humanitarian. Am I, no, are, am I doing something wrong? Or, no. The other question, so if you wanted to. Oh, what? No. You, see, you seem Just, troubled. No, no. Okay. No uh, and I think we, I will, I want to make just one quick point. Yours, I, it's too big. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a new for, um, China is going to be more powerful than we are, and we should be bending our minds to creating an international architecture that works and that China will want to live within and that will maybe China will not want to live as the world's only superpower. I don't know. That, and that is, that is extremely utopian. But by God, we ought to be trying. But I still say, I'll take off that horizon. I think we will be more powerful militarily than China in terms of the number of, of things that we can break. And I'm leaving nukes out of it. Um, and uh, the amount of force that we can apply to a particular problem should we want to do so. I think it's going to take a while for the Chinese to overhaul us on that. But economic power, much more quickly. We ought to be trying, working on international architecture. Now, I know he had his hand up. You That's all I saw. Question, and you too, so. Yes, sir. Yes, you're on. No, I'm so, oh, so you're not was on. waiting. Yeah, then me, please. Yeah, and then you and. <laughs> so you mentioned that it's kind of inherent in American policy that we try to fix things. And I think that kind of permeates American culture, too. Uh, I, I know I grew up kind of, but probably with a very naive conception of uh, the role America might play as a benevolent force in the world, as a country that can help us. It seems that we kind of had that notion shattered, mm -hmm. and that's tough to swallow. And I think even now I'm wondering, why is it so hard to do good? <laughs> You mentioned that we really did try our best in Afghanistan, and it didn't work out. Yeah, I'm much more nuanced. I, I do know something about Afghanistan. I'm more nuanced on that, but I don't want to get down that road because it takes a while. In general, you know, it, it, is Stop. There, You're making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there, why is it so difficult? Is there a way that we could go about these, these projects that would, you know, uh, maximize the positive outcomes that we might have? Why is it that when we try to help, when we try to do positive things, it, it, it really doesn't work out? Is it inherent in the, the task, or is it uh, um, representative of the kinds of decisions? That the it's very States largely have? inherent in the task, I think, and we do have to try to understand better, mm -hmm. but uh, 
in Afghanistan, for example, we have done a lot of good, or a lot of good has happened while we were there, and you know, making a more secure environment in Kabul and particularly in the northern cities than existed before, and they're flourishing enormously. Uh, it's just very, very hard consciously to build a nation, and you have to be have to be careful about how you intervene and remember how radioactive you are because we do a lot of things that belie our, the, our impression of ourselves that we're just out there to do some good in the world. Um, it, it just isn't that way all the time and the, the anger that people close in, in the in the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East feel about our policy, which I think a lot of people recognize is skewed, uh, but that that anger resonates. And while I'm on the subject, drones. That is something, when it goes wrong, and it's going to go wrong, and it has gone wrong, and it will continue to go wrong, and it isn't just Doonesbury's intern uh, saying, whoops, I think I just blew up a village. Uh, it's going to be a lot worse than that. We need to think about that stuff very carefully before we do it. I served uh, for three years in Yemen, and we're droning the hell out of them. And I think there we, our, um, our image is suffering, and we, we need a better image in Yemen, because we're not going to do a whole lot, um, uh, we're not going to put boots in the ground in Yemen, I don't think. Yes, we sir. just have to think smarter and uh, not just say, well, we, we'll kill all the bad guys uh, who we define and um, then uh, life will be better. Thanks. We just have to think more, use anthropologists more than we do. Yeah. Yes, please, no. She knows. Uh, sorry, overconfidence also played a role in Afghanistan. Most of the decisions were made outside with our sort of, without considering the local solutions, mm -hmm. cultural aspects of that. You know, I was born and raised in Afghanistan. You were from Afghanistan? Yes. So I want to share that in some. Who was John Shimon Jr. is. And, um, I was a uh, member of the Afghan student group here. It was around 2008 and 9, and we were always talking about civilian casualty that is damaging the reputation not only, but the effectiveness of the United States working in Afghanistan. Because knowing the culture, and I'm from there, I know that something like that happens is going to be not be forgetting, and it will somehow come back in different forms. And um, so we invited, for example, some <clears throat> lawmakers, local, and just to pass on the message to be careful about that. Not, that never happened. I mean, I understand that it's in inevitable, but um, sort of um, uh, a little bit of arrogance, a little bit of um, you know having all other pieces not working together, DOD versus State Department versus right. CIA, they were all operating on their own as if they, were, they are the one who's taking care of the country. And I think lack of coordination among them, and particularly from the State Department, somebody to really um, get down to the details of uh, some soft power and, and, and things culturally that are important sure. that can fight back in the long term. As an example, just Karzai, for example, now, um, he's against the um, security pact, and, and he's actually building a little momentum in, in, in the people. And one thing that he hooks, um, to the uh, not signing this is that for a long time the American troops didn't respect families and went on over and kicked the doors and sort of night raids, the, the night raids and all that. Um, so and some people say, oh yeah, this is now your time to say no, I'm not going to sign this. You didn't do it the, the way I wanted. Um, so just a few examples that I think overconfidence and not. Um, uh, not really from the beginning, having sure. Afghans to take the lead militarily, intelligence. I was working with the United Nations. I know that the United States didn't actually work at all on the intelligence. 
It was the defense that I worked with the DDR, the Saddam and Demobilization Integration Program, and the police. And the police was kind of weak, defense was good, Minister of Defense, but intelligence didn't work. I think that the smart action in Afghanistan would have been to uh, have them, well, you have the power, just keep it there. Have the locals in the, fr the front line with intelligence, police, and other forces, and only when needed go go and fight yourself. I think that's a lesson, personally, that I think that we can learn from Afghanistan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, um, back to Mr. Putin. So uh, uh, I agree with you that the U.S. and Europe, Europe are really struggling with, with that question how to bring Mr. Putin to his senses. Sentence. I like that formulation. So in order Good. to make some, some, some progress in Syria and, uh, and uh, Europe. At the same time, we, I mean the people of post -Soviet, in post-Soviet countries, Armenians, Georgians, Ukrainians, others, we also struggle with that issue, how to bring Mr. Putin to his senses. Because we believe, especially young people, democratic forces, people who are committed to values of democracy, human rights, we truly believe that uh, Russian leadership style, what they do in former Soviet republics, is really against, you know, they don't kind of let us build our own, own future. And in the sense, I think, the United States and Europe, that they have allies in those countries, but not in, in, in the faces of governments, but people. So, and I think if Europe and US, they put more attention to, to civil society, to democratic forces in those countries, probably it would help in the future to have better bargaining position with Mr. Putin. So, and I just wanted to make reference to Georgian President Saakashvili's, you know, famous interviews he gives everywhere. He says that compares Putin's regime with Stalin's regime, and he says that the biggest difference is that Stalin and others, the communist leaders of that era, they, they used to sleep on coaches, so they didn't like luxury lifestyle. But compared to, to them, Putin and, you know, uh, current Russian leadership, oligarchs, you know, they are heavily dependent on, on Western Western lifestyle and, you know, they, they sign up to, to that culture. So what Saakashvili proposes, he says, you know, you can freeze their bank accounts, you can go after their property in Europe, in, in the United States. And I think this is this kind of soft power, but this is very powerful <laughs> leverage to use. I'm not sure that Joseph Nye would accept yeah, taking somebody's yeah, money as yeah, soft no, power. No, but <laughs> no, not just taking money, because yeah. That, that money gets well, corrupt. It's, it's, it's out of question mm -hmm. that that money mm -hmm. comes out mm -hmm. of you know corrupt pockets. So, I mean, how how you see? What are your thoughts about this? I just want to say I, I hope that Thomas Friedman is right. That I don't know if you've been reading his uh, his columns. You should. Incidentally, he had one immortal quote uh, in the most recent one, which comes interestingly from Ahmed Zaki Yamani, the former. Uh, for many years, decades, uh, Minister of Petroleum of Saudi Arabia, who said, um, <laughs> we didn't leave the Stone Age because there weren't any more stones. <laughs> we, we discovered bronze and it was better. Um, so I think that he is, he is of the view that, um, that there is, and I am too, until told differently, there are ways of bringing horrible pressure to bear on, on Mr. Putin. It's going to take time. And what you have to worry about is what he's going to do as the, pre the, the pressure grows. It's a petro state. It's a rentier state to use the... Uh, and I, we are in a position to deny him his rents. And that has to be done with great forethought, but it's a lot better than than bombing places, it seems to me. Uh, and to show at every stage, you know, we're doing this, we don't like doing it, but people don't like you throwing your weight around. And we don't like it either. But we want to deal with you on A, B, C, D, and E. And if he's going to have a national, you know, uh, bring it on, I don't need any oil. I can sell two villas and I'll be fine for the next three weeks. You know, it isn't, it's not viable. We've got to have him understand that the pressure is there. We feel like ourselves like hostages in, in the hands of Russia. Why? Because any post-Soviet country that wants to make democratic transition to be really independent, mm -hmm. sovereign country, 
he, they, they need to give up something. So Georgia, they gave up Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia. Mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine gave up Crimea. Armenia is very small and we suffered a lot, so we don't have anything to give give up. And the only thing is Nagorno-Karabakh. Where is Mikoyan when you need him? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, <we, laughs> absolutely. But the thing is that Nagorno-Karabakh is, is it's, it's existential for Armenia. So, mm -hmm. so you know, it's a uh, very challenging. Thank you. Anyway. No, I, I just mean, I think in this case we do have because of Putin's mismanagement of his economy. Uh, you know, to become a petrostate is not, is not the way to go. And, uh, so let, let him, you know, keep doing this <laughs> for, for another two decades and then... Keep doing, no, he, the idea is to stop him being able to do it. No, my, my um, point, my I'm, point I'm was... I'm sorry, because okay, anyway. you have two options. Can I um, in a short comment? Julia, the question? I, I can take both questions and, and you can Is this answer. room in use afterwards? Because we no, can we only have five minutes left, so what? can you ask your question and then yeah. I can... Oh, yeah, you've been waiting eight for ages, sorry. Very short. <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, my name is Volker. I should be going back to Africa now uh, with a question. It's about uh, the situation. Do you know the situation now in Central African Republic, South Sudan, and the uh, Eastern... Uh, Eastern region of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, uh, the, the, there is a cycle of wars going there, recurring, and they're spontaneous. Uh, what's the capacity of the peacekeeping uh, uh, forces? That includes uh, the US, uh, the UN, and the AU, that's the African Union. Also, Somalia has had some constructive mm -hmm. relative uh, stability now uh, because of the peacekeeping situation. Uh, help us you know, understand the situation now and the way forward. Yeah. Can those wars stop? Can that cycle, recurring cycle of wars stop? Yeah, I, I will not talk with, uh, with the person on my left about, uh, about uh, the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. I simply see that the potential is there uh, for making the UN military forces more effective. And maybe you know the particular situations, I hope, better than I do. But uh, I just see a real, uh, and I've seen progress. Certainly the AU's record in Somalia has been a lot better than I thought it was going to be. And it's certainly, I know I'm right there, it's better than what was going on before. And. Uh, it, you're going to say, and I think you're right, that there should be more resources put into those, into such operations. And I hope very much that that happens, but I, you want to keep talking, and please do. Yeah, I just want to say that I think the, uh, the U.S. has invested a lot in Somalia. Uh, Not a lot. Oh, oh you mean over time. Uh, we yeah. you know, we yeah. invested the 18 advice, Rangers, yes. Yeah, advice and, and training. Incorporating basically their advice, also making you know friendship. I, I, the, the, the army in Uganda, for example, where yeah. I come from, respects the U.S. Army a lot, so they have a very good uh, relationship, working relationship. Oh, okay. Do you have a question? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, in thinking about what was said earlier, and also things that I've come across, perhaps uh, we uh, have uh, really three not two possibilities, not just soft power, hard power, but maybe a, a third category. Uh, um, it could be more, but at least a third category that's, that's maybe part soft and part hard in, in terms, but not necessarily throwing bombs. Agreed. And there is, uh, I, put, I guess I put hard power, give it a larger area than you do, but let's see, we can say, um, I don't know, um, pretty hard power. And the whole economic piece in dealing with the Soviet Union is no oh, uh, yes. <laughs> The truth will out in the end. Uh, dealing with Russia uh, is that. Uh, and I think that should be used. And it, the nice thing about it is that the things that would happen would be things everybody will be able to observe. Gosh those terminals, uh, LNG terminals on the east coast of the United States are able to put 
and <laughs> to put gas out, not just take it in. You know. Just change the pumps. Exactly. Well, <laughs> don't, don't, I don't have any idea what how much it involves, but I guess it can be done. And these are the kind of signals that should be being sent. But you know, making pronouncements like uh, Russia's a regional power, we didn't have to say that. It's just stupid. What good did it do? And maybe, uh, my friend said, uh, maybe uh, Putin yelled at Obama a lot on the telephone and that he was mad. And Mr. Obama doesn't strike me as somebody who, he seems to be a fairly cool character. And he should have, anyway. Right. I, wish I, he, I agree with you on that. Uh, making, talking about regional power shifts uh, the, the kind of thinking and approaches that we use. So I agree with you. You can you can think of him that way, and that's fine. He probably is, but you don't have to tell him in this press conference, for Christ's sake. Anyway, and I guess I have a right to ask a last question. Um, let's say that yes, because of Afghanistan and Iran, uh, there could be a new view, um, U.S. view on peacekeeping, and that maybe they'll be more willing and likely to to support. UN peacekeeping more than they did before. Um, is it possible that it can be something else than only funding UN peacekeeping? And also because don't you think that they only fund peacekeeping and they don't really send troops to peacekeeping because American yeah. troops under blue helmets could really be seen as partial just because of the inherent nature of the US. Yeah, I which said is they're, a superpower, they're, they're radioactive. Right? Yeah, so I guess that People would like the, the, the U.S. to send more blue helmets, but at the same time, I'm not sure that it would be a good thing for the organization because maybe American blue helmets could transform the organization and make it less legitimate in the perceptions of people. And maybe it would not be a better thing for the organization after, after all. So do you think that the U.S. is aware of this uh, idea and that they that we shouldn't that be sending people under blue helmets? No, they, they should not because it would undermine the impartial nature of UN peacekeeping, at least in the perceptions of people. So, okay. they, so they just want to fund it. That's, a point, I've been, that. I, that's a point I've been trying to make. Uh, I really agree with, um, with Robert Gates. Anybody who, puts, anybody who wants to put American boots on the ground in the Middle East should have her head examined or his head examined. And I think that uh, that is true everywhere. But there is a lot that we can do, not just funding, but there are a lot of things that we can do to, uh, that, is, that only we can do. And I think particularly, as I said, of lift. Uh, you know, you want to move, uh, I don't know, a regiment of, of Ugandan troops to, uh, to not, let's not have it South Sudan, to, to Congo, for example. We can do that faster than anybody else. And we can. We, and that, that's great. We spent three jillion dollars on it. We ought to be able to, but the point is that we can. And there are many other things we can do to help. And I think, I do think generally we'll be wanting to do that. But I don't think boots on the ground is the answer, what, whatever color the helmet is. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, thanks a lot, Mr. Dunbar. It was a great Thank you.